we saw that there's exceptions come into play um, a couple of ways. Let's download the examples from last time so that we can briefly review. Logged on to someone else. I can show up here and log off. Uh, let me log off. Well, this could be a lot of fun, but we're not going to. We're not going to be mean. Okay, let's log on. Here is our example from last time. And we had one set of exceptions that we threw based on exceptions that occurred in the predefined classes that are part of the Java framework. So in this example, We took a look at exceptions where we weren't throwing any exceptions, we were simply catching any exceptions that might occur. So like in this example, I intentionally excuse me, I intentionally generated a couple of exceptions. I by having this little line of code in here, I generated a uh, null object, null pointer exception. And by having my array list go up to 100, I generated a whole bunch of index out of range exceptions. So here, I'm not throwing any exceptions, I'm simply catching the exceptions that are thrown. Okay. Uh, the way that exceptions work are you have a try block, you then catch different exceptions. All right. If I omit an exception from my catch block, what's going to happen? Well, let's find out. The answer is a little more complicated than you might think. The answer is it actually depends on the kind of exception that it is. In this case, it compiled clean, but if I go to run it, 
it blows up with an ugly air. If you remember the example we had last time, it just continued on its merry way. That's what, allows, that's what exceptions allow us to do, to take a problem and not have the program abort, but to take some action. And maybe the action is simply logging it somewhere, displaying a message to the user, whatever. All right. But notice in this case, I did not catch the index out of bounds exception. And therefore, since I didn't catch it, it blew up. All right. Since I didn't catch it, it blew up. If I put that back in, and re-recompile it, it'll continue. And our catch will catch each of the exceptions. And again, we're just displaying a message, but I could do whatever I wanted to with it. So this is only catching those two exceptions. If a third kind of exception popped up, it also wouldn't be caught, and therefore, we would get an error and would blow up. Bottom line is someone has to catch the exceptions, or the program's going to blow up. All right. In this case, the exceptions are generated by the classes in the Java framework, either a null pointer or index out of bounds. Any questions about that one? In the next example, I actually took one of my classes that I created, and we created a triangle class. And I set different exceptions based on what rules exist about triangles. All right, so let's look at this example. In this example, I create a, a triangle. All right, I put in some exceptions. I've said for each of these exceptions, each of the functions where an exception could occur, I've added on to the name of the function that it throws an exception. It throws a specific kind of exception. All right. In this case, it's just throwing the generic exception. And if there's a condition that's met, I use a command, throw new exception, and I can include a message in the constructor that I can display later on. So I have in the constructor of the triangle to set these sides, these three sides of the uh, triangle. And if the sum of two sides is not greater than the third side for all sides, then there's an exception that the triangle, the sides of the triangle are illegal. I also test to see if the different sides are less than 1, because you can't have a 0 length side for a triangle. And I throw an exception if that is the case. So notice I have my if statement to throw the exception, and then on the function I say that it throws the exception. In my test class, then, I have a try, and I can test for different kinds of exceptions and display the answer. I can display what the problem is. So I can test for a null pointer exception. So if there was a the triangle variable t didn't relate to any particular object. If the triangle was null, then I'm going to get a null pointer exception. 
and I can have code written especially to handle that. If there's a number format exception, like there is here, I try to create an integer, but I don't give it an integer. I give it a string. Then I'm going to get the number format exception. Finally, if it just throws a generic exception, it's more than likely going to be one of the exceptions that come from this class. Whereas I've noticed that something is wrong with the data in the triangle, and I throw an exception. I'm going to rephrase this error message to say probably an exception from the triangle. So if I try to set the triangle to 1, 1, and 8, that's not a valid triangle because the sum of two of the sides, 1 and 1, is 2. 2 is not greater than the third side, 8. So we know for a fact that that's an invalid triangle. So I should get the exception from my triangle class. And sure enough. I get the exception. Each side must be less than the sum of the other sides, probably exception from the triangle, which it is. Questions about this? What if I throw an exception and I don't say that the function throws that exception? So in other words, if I remove that throws exception from here, What's going to happen? Well, let's find out. We get an error. All right? Here's why we get an error. And again, we'll talk about the two different kinds of exceptions that exist. If this function can throw an exception, and it can. It will throw an exception if this is true, or an exception will be thrown by each of these functions. So an exception can be thrown out of this function, the constructor. All right? If that's the case, that constructor either has to say that it throws that exception or it has to handle it itself. All right? That is known as a checked exception. So let's look up the details on a checked exception. Checked exception is, is an exception that are checked at compile time. If some code within a method throws a checked exception, then that method must either handle the exception or it must throw it to whoever called it. So that's a checked exception. In other words, let's pretend that we're functions. All right? And Let's say I'm the first function, I call you, then I call you. All right, then he calls you. So I call you, I call you. you call him. He, thro he throws an exception. He has two choices. Either he has to handle that exception or he has to throw that exception. All right? How do you handle an exception? Well, you'd have to have a try catch block in your code that handles it, that catches it and does something with it. If he doesn't have that try catch block, though, he has to say 
in his code that he throws that exception. Which means that the next function either has to throw it, all right, or handle it. So he's going to either need a try catch block or he'll need to throw the exception up to me. So we have that chain of calling. Each step on the calling, there's two choices until someone handles it. Either the function handles it via a try catch block or it throws it. And you have to say in the function definition that this function throws this exception. So when I say it throws that exception, it means there's not going to be any code in here to handle it. It's going to throw it back to whoever called it. So in this case, who called the constructor of the triangle? This unit test did. And it has the code to handle that exception. All right. If I put a catch block in here, if I put all this in a try catch block, like this, with something in there. Then it compiles cleanly because this threw the exception and it caught it. So if you have code that throws an exception that is a checked exception, either it has to handle it itself via a catch block, or it has to throw it back to whoever called it. In this case, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to throw it back to whoever called it. That's typically how it's going to happen in many cases, especially when you think of us adding a user interface to the equation here. If we had a, you know, if we had a, a system to process new student registration and we didn't give some proper values that were required, all right, our student class might throw an exception. Well, it's probably going to be the user interface that the user interacts with to correct that exception. Like maybe you forgot to give a student ID number. Maybe you forgot to enter in the student ID number or something like that. So likely it's going to be the user interface where that error occurs and you'll be able to correct it there. Okay, I forgot to enter a, a, a student ID number. Here I'm going to enter a student ID number. So usually it's not going to be the class itself that throws the exception, but it will be in many cases, the user interface, whoever calls that function that is going to have the code to handle it in. Again, that's normally. You can't say all the time, right? Because you can certainly think of exceptions to that. Anyhow, that's a checked exception. What then is an unchecked exception? Well, there's such a thing as unchecked exceptions, right? Because nowhere in here did I check for the null pointer or anything like that, I can, any one of these instructions could throw a null pointer if the object was null. And I could eliminate the catch for them. None of the code we've written so far has checked for a null pointer or anything like that. And we didn't get compile errors for it, even though this line of code could throw a null pointer exception under the right circumstances. Or, I'm sorry, not this line, this line. 
this line could throw a null pointer exception under the right circumstances. But clearly, we don't have any try catch, and clearly, we don't have uh, anything that says that this throws the exception to something else. Those are known as unchecked exceptions. talks about in C++, all exceptions are unchecked. We're not in C++, so it doesn't matter. In Java, exceptions are either error or exceptions. I'm sorry. Exceptions under error and runtime exception classes are unchecked. Everything else is a checked. Kind of a confusing diagram. But if I make it an exception, it's a checked exception. If I make it a runtime exception or an error, then it's unchecked. So if I change this, instead of saying that this throws an exception, but this throws a runtime exception, then I don't have to have a catch for it anywhere. Because a runtime exception is unchecked. However, if I don't catch it, then Java will catch it and it will blow up. So the question is, is when do you use a checked exception versus an unchecked exception? Use a checked exception if there's a problem that you can probably do something about, all right, that you can correct, that you don't want your code blowing up, but you want to display so someone can maybe take action about it. Because if by making it a checked exception, that is, by throwing an exception or something that inherits from an exception, all right, you can ensure that anyone that throws that exception either handles it or throws it up to the next function until eventually someone handles it. If it's the kind of problem where you don't care if the code blows up, then you can make it an unchecked exception. Like, for example, if you used a, uh, uh, you know, a null pointer exception. A null pointer exception usually means you have a bug in your code. You don't want it to continue. You just want it to blow up and tell you that it blew up. Really nothing you can do about that. So that's an unchecked exception. Now. We can define our own exceptions if we want to further fine tune our exception handling. So I can go in here and I can create and I'm going to call it a triangle exception. Public class triangle exception extends and here is where we decide if this triangle exception is going to be a checked or an unchecked exception. If it extends runtime exception, 
it will be an unchecked exception. If it extends exception, it will be a checked exception. In this case, if I get an exception, I am just going to, I'm not going to have really any special code here. I could put special code in here, though, if I wanted to. I could put attributes, methods, I could do anything that I do normally when I extend a class, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to create a special kind of exception that simply calls the superclasses constructor. Now, why would I bother doing this? I would bother doing this because what I can do is I can make my catches more refined. Instead of just throwing a run-of-the-mill exception if there's a problem, all right? I can throw a triangle exception. It inherits from exception, so it's a checked exception. And then the power of this comes in when we do this. I can then, in my unit test, look for a triangle exception. Then, I don't have to say probably an exception from the triangle class. It's definitely an exception from the triangle class. And any other exception that I catch, well, that must be for some other reason. All right, and I know for sure that it's a triangle exception. So we can define our own exceptions to test for, to see if there's a problem. And therefore, the finer degree that we can define the exception, the finer degree that we can test for the exception. I could take this even further if I wanted to. I could inherit my triangle exception. I could use that as a superclass for Side one triangle exception, side two triangle exception, side three triangle exception. So I could really tell 
which side got set wrong if I wanted to know it at that detail. And I could make each exception throw a different one. Uh, each each uh, uh, function throw a different exception. I can then either test for triangle exception, which would catch triangle exception and anything that inherits from it, <coughs> or I could catch the specific exceptions. So you have a lot of flexibility on how this works. Questions about this? Something bugged me with this example that I realized on Monday. There's a pretty big bug in this, all right? The bug is, is I, when I construct a triangle, it validates to make sure that the triangle is of proper dimensions. So I couldn't, for example, say a triangle had one length, one size length one, another size length one, and a third size length eight, right? Because one plus one is two, two is not greater than eight. And it's a rule that the sum of every pair of sides has to be greater than the third side. So my code catches for that. But guess what? I could set up a triangle that was 3, 4, 5, which is valid, right? Because 3 and 4 is 7. 7 is greater than 5. 4 and 5 is 9. 9 is greater than 3. 3 and 5 is 8. 8 is greater than 4. So I could set that. Then I could change one of the sides to be, I could change the side uh, that has a length 4, I could change it to 1. And then I would have a triangle that is 1, 3, and 5. That's an illegal triangle. So I'm embarrassed. How do you fix that? How do you fix that? There's two ways to fix it. Well, I'm not really putting a catch there. I want to throw an exception. I want to throw an exception if I set any side if that makes it invalid. I could do this. I could duplicate this code. After every set. Because after every set, if I've changed it and made it invalid, then there's a problem. Repeat that, please. We have the initial call handled. Is any changes that we don't have handled? One option would be to do that, but that isn't a good option. Because guess what? When we set these sides, What happens if I wanted to change all three sides? If I had a 3, 4, 5 triangle and I decided to set side 1, set 2, set 3, and sort of in between the triangle was invalid. So what I'm saying is I do something like this. If I said triangle T equals new triangle, 3, 4, 5. That's a legal triangle. If I then wanted to set it, and I say, no, I don't want it to be 3, 4, and 5. I want it to be 1, 1, and 1. All right. If I said T set side 1, to 1, that would change the 3 to a 1. And for that instant, before I set the other two sides, that triangle would be invalid. 
So what I'm going to do is I've come to the conclusion that I need to either set all three sides at the same time or not. All right. So I'm going to make these guys private. First time we're seeing a private method. Private method means it cannot be called from the outside world. I can use it internally, but I can't use it from an outside class. I'm going to create a function now that is public. void called set sides that is going to be And it's going to throw triangle exception. I'm then going to change my constructor to call. and pass the three arguments. And then <clears throat> I'm going to test those arguments here. One. Okay. So now I avoid the trouble of being able to screw up the side of a triangle by setting it correctly and then in initially the constructor and then going and changing one of the sides and making the dimensions of the triangle illegal because I am only giving access to being able to set all three sides. I still have these as private functions, so I can call them inside, but I can't call that from the outside world. Let me compile this and make sure it still works. Pardon me? Oh, good question. I meant these. <laughs> you say that a function throws. When I say that a function throws an exception, I mean that it can throw this exception. That one of the things this function could do is it could throw this exception. So. This triangle throws this exception sometimes. The singular throw, or the throw without an S, means 
right now throw that exception. All right, means yes, we have a problem, throw this exception. So the throws up in the function definition means that that's a potential outcome, that it could throw this exception. The throw, when written like this, says go ahead and actually throw it. OK. This is something that bugged me since we went over this example Monday. And I don't know how many years I used this example without it bugging me. Then all of a sudden it hit me that there's actually a little bug in Well, actually a pretty big bug in here. So. I wanted to fix it and show how to do that. And notice I've maintained the idea of each test is only in there once. All right? So I didn't duplicate the logic exactly. I, had, I created a second function to call so that I didn't have to duplicate this if statement in two places. Questions? I don't think we have time to start. I think the next topic is user interfaces, and I don't want to talk about those today. So let's just end here, and I'll be up in lab. All right, see you up there.